Welcome back to the Deep Discog Dive. It's about time I branch out and offer my skill set to others, so I'm offering my ability to defend society's constructs that don't need defending. Skin? I got you. Gravitational pull in its prime era. Oxygen? No way Drake's knocking that off the charts. You might consider what I do unnecessary, but it's my new bread and butter. Oh, those would be perfect things to defend. But today, I want to go deeper and understand why something has been held up by our society so that I can defend it even harder. So, do I go with mayonnaise or the Beatles? Well, this one is edible. Today, we're talking about the Beatles. Let's dive in. We shall be known simply as the Beatles. This time, we're going all the way back to Liverpool in July 1957. The venue was St. Peter's Walton's Parish Church, the main course was every Brit's favorite meal, a big old plate of Marmite, and the band was the Quarrymen, a group of high school kids including a young John Lennon on guitar. Attending this little church party was an also young Paul McCartney. He met John after the show and eventually joined his band. As Paul started playing with the Quarrymen, he invited his school friend George Harrison to come watch, and despite John's initial objection, that he was too young, George later joined on guitar. The boys went off to university but continued playing as Johnny and the Moondogs, though eventually their friend and other bandmate Stuart Sutcliffe suggested a name change to the Beat Alls, which morphed into the Silver Beatles, the Silver Beat Alls, and finally, the Beatles. But enough about stupid bugs, the Screamin' 60s are here, and the band got their first residency booked in Hamburg, Germany. There was a major problem though. They didn't have a drummer. But don't worry, in no time at all, the Beatles recruited their drummer, the guy you all know and love, Pete Best. <laughs> Despite Stuart leaving early on to become a painter, the Hamburg residency was a success. It gave the boys a passionate fan base, as well as a set list stacked with rock and roll and R&B standards. Their time in Hamburg also resulted in the first ever officially released Beatles recording, my Bonnie by Tony Sheridan, with the boys as a backing band. But you know what they say, the best recordings are seeds that eventually grow into massive trees. At least that's what I tell myself. Because that recording eventually found its way to Brian Epstein, a record store owner in the UK. Once the boys came back and started playing shows at the Cavern Club in Liverpool, he swung by one of their shows and soon became the band's manager. Through Brian, the boys also connected with George Martin, the head of the Parlophone label at EMI. And shortly thereafter, they booked their first studio session at EMI Studios in June 1962. This was a great opportunity for the band to see what aspects of their live shows translated well and what aspects didn't. One thing that didn't translate was the drumming. The other bandmates and Martin weren't loving Pete Best's drumming in the studio, so they dismissed Pete and brought in Richard Starkey, known by his stage name, Ringo Starr. The initial reaction by fans to the change was not positive at first. Pete Best fans held vigils outside his house. George even got headbutted by one of them. But eventually fans were all peace and love with Ringo. That should be his catchphrase. Anyway, from their first session, we got the Beatles' first three singles, Love Me Do, Please Please Me, and P.S. I Love You. Though, fun fact, George wasn't huge into Ringo's drumming either, so the guy playing drums on these recordings is Andy White with Ringo on tambourine. The band made plans to record a proper full-length album, but not before Lennon and McCartney started a publishing company for their songwriting partnership. One might think that this move was very smart, given the wealth of classic songs these two would eventually give us, but remember that one of those songs is Obla Di Obla Da. I'm joking, I I'm just joking. I'm actually gonna defend that song later on. Just let me have a bit of fun, okay? The Beatles set up shop at EMI Studios for one 13-hour session in February 1963. And the next month, we got their debut album, Please Please Me. The main goal of this record was to take the high energy of their live shows and put it on record as authentically as possible. And with that goal in mind, I'd say they succeeded. All the singles I mentioned earlier are on here, and they all work well within the context of the record. Plus, the other originals hold their own too. I Saw Her Standing There is such a good opener, and there's a place as some of my favorite vocal harmonies on any early Beatles track. That said, I'm bummed that one of the singles, From Me To You, didn't make it onto the track list. This is gonna keep being a trend. In the 60s, singles and albums were often treated as separate entities, so many of the Beatles' biggest singles were never put on their albums. And while McCartney and Lennon are the main songwriters and sing on most 
most of the songs, both George and Ringo get their chance to vocally shine. George on Do You Want to Know a Secret, and Ringo on their cover of The Shirelles Boys. Now let me be clear, this album is not some kind of resounding achievement. While it does communicate the no-frills energy of their early days, it is easily the most basic album they will ever make. Unless this is your first time hearing 12-bar blues or harmonicas, this is not going to blow your mind. Part of that is the short time they had to record, and part of that is the boys' relative inexperience. You can feel those limitations mostly in the covers, which comprise about half the record. That said, I love their rendition of Twist and Shout as a closer. They actually chose to do this one last because not only was John sick, but it required him to sing as if a bird was trying to burrow into his throat. It is a fierce vocal performance, still one of my favorites of his. Please Please Me may be basic, but it's also pure. It's a pure distillation of why the Beatles, or at least the early Beatles, were so beloved. It won't convince a non-believer, and it doesn't even compare to what they will go on to make, but as far as debut records go, this is a solid first step. The Beatles embarked on their first tours shortly before Please Please Me came out, one tour with four American acts and one with Roy Orbison. And boy, were people excited to see the Beatles play. It, it was like a craze or, or a mania. A, a Beatle mania. Beatle mania is a legitimate psychological phenomenon with a whole bunch of intersecting societal facets. The popularity of rock and roll, the aftermath of World War II, young British women feeling more liberated, the androgynous mop top haircuts of the boys making them more approachable. It is the Venn diagram to end all Venn diagrams. As Beatle mania tightened its grip around the necks of the UK's youth, the Beatles worked on their second album. Unlike Please Please Me, this one got the benefit of not having to be recorded in a day. Session span from July to October 1963, and in November of that year, we got with the Beatles. Now with the added session time and more confidence in the studio, one might expect that this album would be an improvement over Please Please Me. To which I say... Uh, it's not a bad record by any means, and it has some great early Beatles tracks. All My Lovin', It Won't Be Long, their cover of Meredith Wilson's Till There Was You. But as a whole, it feels like the album has a bit of an identity crisis. The originals and the covers on the first record, they all blended well together. I wouldn't have been able to tell you Anna Go To Him was an Arthur Alexander song if my life depended on it. On With The Beatles, though, for the most part, the originals are the sappy love songs, and the covers are the rock and roll tunes. The boys play well with both sides of the coin, but the coin question is like a quarter on one side and a gold doubloon on the other. Neither are bad, they just feel weird being put together. In fact, if you want a better distillation of rock and roll than the Beatles' second album, you need only look to the Beatles' second album. What? Okay, so here's the thing. Back in the 60s, it was pretty typical for British albums to be uh, modified for the US. As a result, the Beatles albums that us damn Yankees got had different covers, different titles, and different track lists. This must have been payback for the American Revolution. This trend would continue for the Beatles until the late 60s, but these days the UK release schedule is the one that's considered canon and the one I'll be covering with one exception, but we'll ride that magical bus when we get to it. As it relates to the Beatles' second album, the US version combines the rock and roll tracks of the first two UK releases, and it's considered a great showcase for the band's early rock days. With the Beatles though, it's a fine record, but not essential listening. With the Beatles shot to the top of the UK charts immediately, easily knocking off the previous album at number one, their first album. The boys had inspired a damn cult in the UK, but the US was still in need of converting. This was in large part because of the staggered release schedule, and also US record labels just not getting the band's appeal. But after enough buzz, EMI's American counterpart, Capitol Records, finally decided, okay, fine, we'll make a lot of money. I Wanna Hold Your Hand, released in January 1964, and became their first number one hit in the States. The first true sign of Beatlemania taking over the US. The second sign happened a month later, when the Beatles flew across the pond to play the Ed Sullivan Show. The broadcast was watched by over 73 million viewers, i.e. over a third of the US population. Once again, we can pin the band blowing up in the States on multiple phenomena converging. Sure, there was the whole youthful rebellion angle, but this performance happened shortly after President JFK was assassinated. And some say this moment helped the nation's youth recover from that tragedy. Make no mistake, Beatlemania was a worldwide plague. But, but like the good kind. More propaganda was needed to fuel this enormous monster, and what do monsters love to eat more than three film deals from United Artists? The silver screen called out to the Beatles. With a movie, not only would more people get to see the Beatles without risking a restraining order, but they could pair it with a soundtrack. 
And so, in July 1964, we were treated to A Hard Day's Night. When it comes to singles, this record is absolutely stacked. A Hard Day's Night is my favorite song from the record and one of their best early singles, from that iconic opening chord to the instantly infectious chorus hook to that arpeggio on the guitar fading out at the end. That opening chord's harmonic ambiguity actually inspired a decades-long debate over the exact chord structure. Music theory, don't do it kids. The other single, Can't Buy Me Love, is also excellent. I love the descending verse melody and the transition back into the chorus. I don't care too much for money. The ballads especially pop the hell off, If I Fell, Things We Said Today, and I Love Her. While I don't return to the whole album that often, the songs I like are always worth going back to. If anything, A Hard Day's Night is as noteworthy for what else it represented for the band. It was their first album comprised entirely of original songs, it was their first soundtrack, and it was their first album recorded on four-track tape machines. On that last point, because of when they came to prominence, going through the Beatles' discography is kind of like going through the history of audio recording in the 1960s. Now I could geek out about that sort of thing all day. I went to school for audio engineering, and most of my coursework was based around Beatles recordings. That said, I'll try not to go off on a giant tear, though trust me, it's taking all of my energy to not start ranting about the subtle changes in drum miking between albums. Along with the album, I'll take a quick second to talk about the movie A Hard Day's Night. It's a mock documentary following the Beatles over a 36 hour period as they play songs and act like a bunch of cheeky little buggers. There's also this old man who's Paul's grandpa and he gets into shenanigans of his own. There's not much story beyond that, but I still enjoyed watching it. It's seen by many as one of the first mockumentary style movies, and it's even in the Criterion Collection. I wouldn't go as far as to say you need to watch it if you're not a Beatles fan, but if you are, it's easily the first Beatles movie I would recommend. The Beatles continued to strike while the iron was engulfed in the hottest flame known to mankind with their first worldwide tour. While they were out on the road, the boys were introduced to Bob Dylan. This meeting is considered notable for many reasons. Dylan had a critical acclaim that the Beatles didn't really have at the time. The boys, John and George especially, looked up to Dylan as a truly free artist, able to create without having to worry about touring or sales. And from this meeting, the Beatles gained a newfound aspiration in their art to experiment and mature into respectable songwriters. They also got into weed. Unfortunately, we wouldn't get to see the fruits of their aspirations just yet, because in December 1964, we got Beatles for Sale. I'll take 20. As you might infer from that title, this one was produced in somewhat cynical circumstances. The band were starting to feel creatively hampered by the constant album turnaround, and unlike their last record, they had to throw in covers to bolster up the track list. But even considering the cynicism and the covers, I like this one. It's the subtle differences that make this a step forward for the band. There's a broader range of instruments and lyrical themes on display. Specifically, the one-two opening punch of No Reply and I'm a Loser are the first instances of the Beatles writing specifically about themselves. Or rather, John writing about himself, since he primarily wrote both songs. In fact, this kind of feels like John's album more than anyone else's. He really gets to shine as a vocalist on here, like on the cover of Chuck Berry's Rock and Roll Music, though I feel like the rest of the gang play tamely by comparison. The rest? I don't hate it or anything, but there are some moments where you can feel the Beatles just being over it all, like the cheesy Mr. Moonlight or Ringo's whatever vocals on Honey Don't. All in all, Beatles for Sale is the Growing Pains album. It's the first sign that the Beatles were tired of what they were, and over the next three records, we're going to see those Growing Pains play out until the Beatles get to achieve their dream of writing Yellow Submarine. It was one fateful night in early 1965 as George, John, and their two partners were having dinner with George's dentist. Perhaps as revenge for none of them flossing regularly, the dentist slipped LSD into all their drinks. But both George and John welcomed the newfound cognitive possibilities it brought, and over the next few years, they would get Paul and Ringo into the stuff as well. Maybe it was because of the drugs, or just artistic ambitions, that the boys wanted to keep up the growth exhibited on Beatles for Sale. With the director of Hard Day's Night, they began working on their second film, originally titled Help. However, when they learned that name was already copyrighted, they did something brilliant and called it Help. The movie and accompanying soundtrack were released in August 1965. Fun fact, the album cover has the boys spelling out a word in flag semaphore. They planned to spell out Help, but they had to settle for noobs. Help is certainly another solid step in maturing the Beatles' music and lyrics. Sure, there are the usual gooey love songs, but in between are songs that tackle other topics and are not gooey in any way. The title track was once described by 
John is one of the only two true Beatles songs he ever wrote, and there's an emotional honesty that No Reply and I'm a Loser were only hinting at. In fact, John is once again the overall MVP on this album. There's help, of course, and Ticket to Ride is on the surface about the girl you love leaving town. John would later call this song one of the earliest heavy metal records. No? You've Got to Hide Your Love Away is basically John's impersonation of Bob Dylan, which is not bad in the slightest. I love how rustic the guitar sounds, and how satisfying the hay is in the chorus. Hey, you've got to hide your love away. Heck, even George gets in on songwriting. We get his first two officially released songs, I Need You and You Like Me Too Much. I'm not huge on the former, but I've always had a soft spot for the latter. I will admit though, nostalgia is a reason why. My first time hearing this was a fan MV of that BBC show, The Thick of It. I know, right? How weird. But arguably, the biggest song everyone remembers off this record belongs to Paul. It is, of course, Scrambled Eggs. I mean yesterday. Now, I'll admit, we're starting to get to Beatles songs that have imbued themselves into my nostalgic core, so I may be a bit biased. That said, I think this song is pretty much perfect. It's the epitome of melancholy, with just the right amount of production, and a melody that feels like it had existed for years before McCartney sung it. It's also unique in their catalog because the Beatles had sung breakup songs before this, but none of them really felt like breakup songs. They were still fairly upbeat. This one, though, is perfectly content to sit in its emotional distraught and not offer up any kind of positive resolution. It's a risky move, but it's one that paid off in dividends. I will say though, I don't like that it's the penultimate track and the closer is just a pretty basic cover. To end on yesterday might have been too much of a gamble, but still. I'll also drop in my thoughts on the Help movie. Instead of being a mockumentary, this time we've got a James Bond parody. The sacrificial cult is hunting Ringo down because of the ring pop affixed to his hand. Beyond that, there is virtually no plot. It's basically just the Beatles go to a place, they run from the cult, they sing songs, they go to a new place, repeat for 90 minutes. It also has some of the funniest ADR work I've ever seen in a movie. <laughs> So yeah, it's way goofier than A Hard Day's Night, and I would only recommend it if you love the Beatles or this album, but it's still a good time. And speaking of Hard Day's Night, at one point they play an Indian version of that song. Believe it or not, this was George's first exposure to Indian music, and it's what would inspire him to incorporate Indian influences on... Help got a slightly different kind of attention by the public this time. Sales were once again through the roof, but it got the kind of highbrow critical acclaim that had been lacking for the band up to this point. It was even the first album by a rock band to get a Grammy nomination for Album of the Year. The same month as Help's release, the band kicked off yet another tour starting at Shea Stadium. This is considered one of the most famous Beatles concerts, but it was a turning point for the band. After two years of playing shows, they were starting to get just a little bit annoyed of the screaming and not being able to hear themselves. Not even being knighted by the Queen or having their own animated sitcom on ABC could help. That's what I usually do when I'm feeling down. So when they got back in the studio, their goal was to make not just a bunch of songs, but a complete artistic expression. They didn't have much time though. Their record deal with EMI up to this point required two albums a year, and with help coming out in August, the boys needed to act quick. In the lead up to this next album, we got two non-album singles, Day Tripper and We Can Work It Out. These are two of my favorite Beatles singles. The former has one of the best guitar lines of any Beatles song, and I love the bridge on the latter, especially with the meter change. And fighting, my friend. Those two songs, plus the rest of the album, were finished in less than a month, and in December 1965, we got Rubber Soul. Right off the bat with the opener Drive My Car, something feels different. There must have been something in the air when these guys were recording this. Oh wait, there was, it was we. Rubber Soul, according to John, is the pot album. Now, jokes aside, the boys weren't blazed while recording. They would smoke between sessions, but recording was more focused this time, as the boys were determined to use the studio as an instrument more than ever. And the determination paid off. This is the most full-sounding album the Beatles have made so far. Helping Matters is what sounds like a greater presence of low-end than past records. Apparently, Otis Redding's respect was a guiding influence on that. And the more full-sounding recordings give way to stellar tracks like the the sitar-led Norwegian Wood, the intimate Michelle and Girl, and especially the excellent vocal harmonies on Nowhere Man and The Word. Paul got to have his basically perfect song on Help, and now it's John's turn to play with perfection. In My Life is a remarkable encapsulation of nostalgia with just the right balance between wistfulness and heartache. According to legend, this song's harpsichord solo in the bridge inspired other artists to use harpsichord as well. 
which is funny because it's not actually a harpsichord, it's George Martin playing a piano sped up. This is weird though. Once again, we have a Beatles album with a lackluster closer. Run For Your Life is okay musically, but the lyrics read like it's about a murderer chasing someone. It's a weirdly maudlin note to end an otherwise beautiful and introspective album. Potential hot take? This is the first truly great Beatles album. The ones before this are fine in their own right, but Rubber Soul is the first to feel truly cohesive. I wanted to get that off my chest because I feel like this one gets overshadowed sometimes since it came out right before. You might think that a more experimental album like Rubber Soul might not do as well as the last few records, but let me ask you, do you know what power we have been facing? Rubber Soul not only sold like Beetle Busters, but it also earned the Fab Four a newfound level of critical and artistic respect. It's the record that inspired Brian Wilson to make Pet Sounds, the one that got Mick Jagger to start writing his own material, the one that eventually inspired John Cale and Lou Reed to start the Velvet Underground. It's the first time where the Beatles truly threw down the gauntlet in pop music. So what did they do next? Rest. And LSD. That's right, the Beatles actually got to take three months off from anything Beatles related. A much deserved break, if you had asked me in the 60s. When the band reconvened in spring of 1996, they were excited to get back into the studio and try new things. They didn't even care if these new songs could be performed live. Can you believe that? I mean, these guys could never stop touring. In spring 1996, we got two new singles, Paperback Writer and Rain. The former is excellent, not just in its writing, but in its production. There's more bass on it than any previous song of theirs, and it was mixed louder too, which of course means that it's automatically better. After completing the album, the Beatles went out on the road for what feels like the hundredth time. This time they performed throughout Germany, Japan, and the Philippines. By this point, the band were feeling pretty sick of the touring routine, so perhaps as some sign from God, this tour was, by all accounts, a nightmare. The German leg was relatively okay, though it was hampered by a sour return to Hamburg and the first instances of Beatles fans being held back and beaten by police forces. The Japan leg started out worse, mainly due to the Beatles playing a venue considered sacred for martial arts. That booking led to a wave of death threats from Japanese traditionalists, but once they started playing shows, the atmosphere was much more positive. The Philippines leg was legit terrifying. The band were invited to a breakfast by the president's wife, which they turned down. Pro tip, if you find yourself in the Philippines, do not turn down a breakfast from the president's wife. The rejection became national news and made these four blokes public enemy number one, and following the run of shows, the band had to effectively be smuggled out of the country to avoid ridicule and violence. This dreadful run of dates ended just as their next album, Revolver, released in August 1966. The record kicks off with George Harrison's aggressive tax man. That's right, we finally get the Beatles' first outwardly political song. I always enjoy the sitar-inspired guitar solo. In fact, there's an edge to tax man that doesn't pervade the whole record, but it catches the senses when it comes up. The guitars can sound harsher, the vocals can sound more ragged, the drums can sound more impactful. I should take a second to shout out the new engineer whom the Beatles would work with until 1969, Jeff Emmerich. Jeff was, by all accounts, a perfect engineer to help the Beatles experiment in the studio. Even doing such insane things like like putting a mic within three inches of the kick drum, which was a huge no-no at EMI Studios at the time. But like I said, it's not all angry. In fact, Revolver has what might be considered the first Beatles children's song, Yellow Submarine. And I don't like this song. I mean, it's fine, and if you liked it as a kid, then more power to you. But the way they sing the chorus just gets really annoying after a few listens. It's definitely my least favorite of the two kiddish Beatles songs sung by Ringo. Here, There, and Everywhere is, in some moments, my favorite Paul McCartney ballad. Few things hypnotize me as well as that vocal leap he makes in the verses. Running my hands through the Eleanor Rigby as a kid blew my McFrickin' mind. I just didn't think pop music could sound like this or be about things like this. You're telling me these guys made a pop song about lonely, sad people with no percussion or guitars, just vocals and a string quartet? I don't like this anymore. Put on Sheryl Crow. Got to Get You Into My Life is a song I go back and forth on. It's a sweet song and it's super catchy, but the horns always sound cheap to me. I don't know, if they doused him with just a bit of reverb, I feel like I'd like him more. But any complaint I have pales in comparison to this part. Every Beatles song would be better if it had that guitar lick. And then, to close out, we get Tomorrow Never Knows. It's like the Beatles knew their past few albums had ended on mediocre songs and then made a closer good enough to make up for all of them. This song is the perfect combo of convention and experimentation. The excellent vocal melody by John sticking out as he is engulfed by tape effects and noise loops. That reversed guitar part after the first verse never fails to give me chills. <laughs> Thank you. 
Revolver is a damn good record that takes the Beatles to a completely new level. I don't know if I'm strong enough to call it the best Beatles album, but if I heard you call it that, I would definitely look your way and give you a sincere nod of approval, knowing that you're living a more fulfilling life than I ever could. End of part one. Intermission. End of intermission. Part two. That's right, we are now officially in the Beatles' imperial era. The records we talk about from here on out are the ones that kids will be named after. Revolver was critically and commercially recognized as the bonkers achievement it was, and the band needed that boost, especially after their disastrous overseas tour and their next US tour starting in August of 66. Now, the Beatles were facing a bit of controversy in the States around this time. Their latest US album, Yesterday and Today, was getting negative press because of its butchered cover. Yeah, I meant butchered literally. Yes, that is an actual album cover of the Beatles dressed as butchers with severed baby doll parts around them. Capitol tried to take back all existing copies of this album, costing them nearly $2 million when adjusted for inflation. It's for that reason that this version of the album is seen as a collector's item. So if you ever come across the Beatles covered in baby pieces, congrats, you're rich. Man, it would suck if they had to deal with another wave of controversy after that. Like, say, I don't know, backlash to a comment John made months prior Prior to a UK outlet about how the Beatles were bigger than Jesus. Oh, praise be! Suffice it to say, mid-1960s America did not take kindly to this comment. Radio stations banned the group's music, more death threats ensued, and there were even burnings of their music held by the Ku Klux Klan. So it was because of... I don't know, take a pick from the list, that the Beatles decided to stop touring and focus solely on recording. Their show at Candlestick Park on August 29th would be the last proper live show the band would ever play. For the next three months, the bandmates stepped away from Beatles work, spent time with family, pursued side projects. This led skeptics to believe that the boys' rapid fan base would soon dissipate, and actually, yeah, that did sort of happen. Other bands like the Monkees would soon come along to command the youth's attention. So while eyes were still on the Beatles, the insane attention they had gotten wasn't as present. Oh no, they must have been so bombed by that. They eventually reconvened in November of 66 to work on a new album. So we're now past the Beatles as performing titans. What do they sound like as studio lab rats? In February 1967, we got the singles Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane. Now these are two fascinating songs in how they're similar, and how they're different. They're both inspired by childhood. The former is about John's time running around a Salvation Army children's home near his own abode. The latter is named after a bus stop Paul would walk to. And sonically, they're a bit similar, both taking some aspects from Revolver and imbuing them with orchestral and music hall influence. But whereas Penny Lane is more conventional in its structure and lyrics, Strawberry Fields Forever is ambiguous and sprawling and even contradictory at times. And it's in between musical keys, off to jail with John Lennon. Despite the the critical attention Strawberry and Penny got, it was somehow nothing compared to what would follow. In May 1967, the Beatles released Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. This is the album. This is the one. Close your eyes and imagine an album. It's scientifically guaranteed that this is the album you thought of. Sgt. Pepper is one of those records that has achieved a level of acclaim that is reserved for the absolute top of the cream. And you know, this might be controversial, but I think it gets that acclaim because it's a good album. If I had to distill what makes Sgt. Pepper special or unique over past records, it's the orchestration. The album's concept allowed the band to inhabit a new persona, which gave them an excuse to make the most bombastic orchestral music possible in 1967. It's genuinely insane that these songs were recorded onto just four tracks. Sort of. See, Jeff Emmerich and the Beatles still had just four tracks of tape to work with, but they realized that they could sum those four tracks together onto one track of another tape machine. These guys effectively pioneered a primitive form of multi-track recording. Of course, the songs everyone knows here are good. The title track is such an effective opener, demonstrating how these new sonic influences would meld with the boys' usual rock. It bleeds seamlessly into With a Little Help From My Friends, which might have Ringo's best vocal performance on any Beatles album. Getting Better is a jaunty bop about looking on the bright side of things with a now infamous lyrical escalation. Verse 1, I used to not do too well at school. Verse 2, I used to get really mad. Verse 3, I used to hit my wife. Boy, what a jerk I was. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is John's chance to shine with vivid imagery in the verses and a memorable chorus. Wait a second, that title forms an acronym. 
ITW. Within You, Without You is George's only songwriting contribution, a sermon inspired by his own studies of Indian music and Hinduism. I love the instrumental section where the strings and sitar start trading parts. <laughs> And of course, the closer, A Day in the Life, a mini suite showcasing the best of what Paul and John were capable of. And those two orchestral builds never get old. The only guidance that the orchestra got for playing boiled down to, you start at this note, you end at this note, you've got 24 bars, whatever happens in between is up to you. But as I get older, losing my hair, it's the deep cuts that stand out to me more and more. Fixing a Hole is about Paul's annoyance over rabid Beatlemania. It's kind of a tell-off to fans, but the lovely verse melody does a good job of covering that fact up. When I'm 64 is also just lovely. The pseudo ragtime instrumental with Paul waxing about the domestic life. Nice track. And um, I'm not fully ready to admit this yet, but I might like the reprise of the title track more than the title track. Then again, it's in F major, the best key, so I might be biased. I will say though, not every song is a winner. She's Leaving Home sounds gorgeous, but it's so languid in its pace. Unless I'm doing a full album listen, I never check it out. And Good Morning, Good Morning gets annoying pretty quickly. But honestly, imperfections aside, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band is a titanic achievement. It's the kind of record that shows what popular music can sound like and what it can be. This is gonna blow your mind hole, but people liked Sgt. Pepper. It was a similar situation to the time in which they made their debut. When Sgt. Pepper came out, the summer of love had just started. Young folks were expanding their minds, taking drugs, doing things that my mom said she'd tell me about when I get older. And so Sgt. Pepper was the perfect soundtrack. But even still, there was an opportunity for the Beatles to write an anthem for this movement. The band signed up to play the first ever worldwide satellite TV production, Our World, in June of 1967. And so the Beatles wrote and played all You Need Is Love. I like how this one harkens back to the band's older days. It's a pretty simple song lyrically, but for a theme like worldwide love, it works as well as it needs to. I also like how the verses are sung out of time with the rest of the band, and how someone starts yelling the chorus of She Loves You during the fade out. Along with All You Need Is Love, we got the B-side, Baby You're a Rich Man, which you most likely know from the ending of The Social Network. Unfortunately, not everything would be peace and love, because in August 1967, Brian Epstein unexpectedly passed away. To say this shook the Beatles would be an understatement. Brian was instrumental to the band's business success, to the point where he was often named the fifth Beatle. And it was due to his death that Paul decided to bring the band together for a project that Epstein had approved. The idea was a film based around a psychedelic bus tour. It would be mostly improvised, and it would be made entirely by the band. Granted, they had never made a movie on their own, but so what? They made a day in the life. After filming and recording, Magical Mystery Tour released in late 1967. I actually briefly offered my thoughts on this one during another video. There is not a bad album in their discography, which you can't say for most bands. Yeah, let me know when they make their Magical Mystery Tour, am I right? Never mind, they never will. And boy, so many Beatles fans loved to hear that. Now, I will be transparent with you all. See? When I made that joke, I had not actually heard Magical Mystery Tour in full. I was but a mere sheep, following in the steps of those who had bashed the movie. And trust me, we'll get to that. But I'm willing to acknowledge my own shortcomings, because I ended up enjoying this one. It continues in the same lane as Sgt. Pepper, but it definitely feels way less cohesive and way more surreal. I Am The Walrus is one of those moments where the surrealism works. It's a delightfully Baroque arrangement with one of the most obtuse sets of lyrics John ever wrote. Apparently, John wrote them as a response to those who did serious lyrical studies of their past songs. So basically, John wrote the first ever trolling song. Also, I don't know why, but I'm betting that the walrus was George. The title track is a fine opening, but the best part, in my opinion, is the jazzy outro that lasts for all of 15 seconds at the end. I wish that could have been its own track. Also, I've seen a lot of people trash it, but I like Your Mother Should Know. It's sweet, all right, get off my back. The second half of this album, though, is absolutely stacked. Every song on it could be a single. And I say that because every song was a single. Yeah, all of these songs I've already touched on, except Hello Goodbye, which I do like a good bit. Were these singles added just to fatten up the track list? The answer is yes in the US. In the UK, Magical Mystery Tour was the first ever double EP released with just the songs written for the film, which means this is the one instance where the US album is the one considered canon. So yes, Magical Mystery Tour is a good album. 
I cannot say the same for the movie. It's an hour long made for TV movie and it's a glorified vehicle for the Beatles to make music videos for the brand new tracks. Which I mean, I guess so were the last two, but it's especially obvious here. Everything in between the songs ranges from goofy to bizarre. If you look to your left, ladies and gentlemen, the view is not very inspiring. Ah, but if you look to your right, it's also the first movie where the Beatles don't really interact much with each other. Aside from the music vignettes and these two wizard skits, they don't interact as a group at all. If you're into the more off-kilter side of the Beatles, maybe you'll like this. If not, feel free to pass. But anyway, yes, Magical Mystery Tour is not the black sheep of the Beatles catalog by any means. Because that title belongs to another record that we'll get to later. Magical Mystery Tour was the first time a Beatles project did not live up to initial expectations. It sold pretty well in the US, but the UK just wasn't having it. It didn't help that I Am The Walrus received virtually no radio support. This is believed to be because the song used the British slang word for panties. But the Beatles didn't mind. Their eyes were set to the future as they looked to brush off the psychedelic appearance and move into their next era. But they would need guidance, or at least a chance to get away. And so, in February 1968, the Beatles set out to India for a 15-week Transcendental Meditation Study, though before leaving they did release the single Lady Madonna. They went with a whole bunch of other celebrities, including the Beach Boys' Mike Love, Mia Farrow, and others. The majority of their next album would be written while on this trip. For example, Mia Farrow's sister Prudence was on the trip, but never left her room. This of course inspired the classic song, Everybody's Got Something to Hide Except Me and My Monkey. However, none of the Beatles would end up staying the full 15 weeks for various reasons. So what would their next project be after getting back from India? A contractual obligation. Remember that super fun and cool three film deal with United Artists? Since they made it themselves, Magical Mystery Tour was not the last film in that deal. Instead, they had to supply some new songs for an animated film called Yellow Submarine. As soon as the Yellow Submarine songs were done, the Beatles got to work on their next proper album. And following their retreat, the blokes were feeling rejuvenated and ready to collaborate. <laughs> These boys did not like each other. The tensions came primarily from three things. One, the band was in the process of forming their own company, Apple Corps, and the logistics of starting it were hellish. Two, they were taking over business affairs after Brian's death and trying to stay on top of the business side of things exhausted them. And three, their policy of having no spouses in the studio was broken as all four mates started bringing their partners into the studio. One of those partners was brand new to their circle as John had just gotten divorced to be with an artist named Yoko Oh, no. Suffice it to say, everybody was pissed. John thought Paul's songs were cloying. Paul thought John's songs were too noisy. George was mad that more of his songs weren't being considered for the album. Jeff Emmerich quit halfway through his session. Ringo quit for a bit right before the album was done, leading to him not being on the album's first two songs. These were the most difficult studio sessions the Beatles had done so far. But that doesn't mean the resulting music wasn't good. In August of 68, the boys put out two more singles, Hey Jude and Revolution. Hey Jude was written by Paul for John's son after John divorced his first wife. I don't know if there's anything else to say about this one. It's a classic, one of my favorite melodies from Paul, and a great four minute outro. That one flat seven, four, one progression is what I put as a dependent on my taxes. And spoilers for like three minutes from now, but this version of Revolution is my favorite. Three months later, in November 1968, the Beatles released their self-titled album, also known as The White Album. As opposed to the more genre-fluid styles of the past two records, The White Album puts up hard walls between each of its songs. When a song is a ballad, it's a ballad. When it's a rocker, it's a rocker. When it's obla di obla da, it's considered garbage. Yeah, this album's lead single in most territories is not viewed in that great of a light these days, but in its defense, Whatever. Like, it's not actively harmful, it's just a kind of annoying homage to ska music of all things. Plus, I've also seen a lot of people who love it for its happy-go-lucky attitude. It works for some people, just not for also some people. What works for me, though, is the opener back in the USSR, the Beatles doing a parody of Chuck Berry and the Beach Boys. Few things in music amp me up as much as the end of the second chorus. Back in the US, back in the US, back! Rocky Raccoon is a honky-tonk ballad about a guy who gets shot by his wife's lover and then finds God. I like the song, but I love this one bit with Ringo's snare. He drew fast and shot. A subtle display of text painting, such a nice touch. While My Guitar Gently Weeps is one of George's four contributions to the album, and of course, it's his best. This song shows one thing I love about the Beatles. They have songs that can be written for any setting and instrument and still sound great. Whether it's Prince shredding out a guitar, or Jake Shimabukuro playing on a ukulele. Well, 
Glass Onion is great not just for its commanding staccato guitars, but also for John being cheeky with the Beatles' legacy. Well, here's another goofy the was Honey, you're not gonna believe what I just bet the house on. Helter Skelter was the Beatles' attempt to out-who the who, and it resulted in what some consider to be one of the earliest heavy metal records. Only the Beatles could write an abrasive headbanger about a playground slide which eventually inspires a man to become a cult leader. Blackbird is another one of those songs that has so permanently wedged itself into my nostalgia. It's Paul's commentary on the civil rights movement with some of his best guitar playing ever. I will say it now, strike me down if you must, Martha My Dear is my favorite Beatles deep cut. I love the melody, I love the strings, I love how the guitars enter in to ramp up the energy, I love the horns, I love the dog it's written about. Now you might be saying, Mike boy me snare, you're heaping praise onto so many of these songs. Clearly, you love the White Album, to which I say, no. While the White Album has some of the best songs to ever make a Beatles album track list, there is also quite a bit of filler. Also, I mentioned the hard genre walls earlier, which makes this an eclectic listen, but it also means that it can veer wildly in mood. An example being Your Blues and Mother Nature's Son, two fine tracks on their own that just throw me for a loop every time I listen to them back to back. Don't Pass Me By is the first Beatles song written by Ringo Starr, and if I ever have to talk about it again, then you know something has gone horribly wrong. And the last quarter of the album just doesn't really do it for me. Revolution 1, Savoy Truffle, and The Closer Goodnight are okay, but everything else is in one ear and out the other. Well, except, <laughs> how, how, how could I forget? Revolution 9, a nine minute music concrete piece primarily by John and Yoko. The idea is neat, good on them for seeing it through, I don't think it needed to be on here, and certainly not as the penultimate track on an album that's as long as Train Spotting. Don't get it twisted, there are some grade A clunkers on the White Album. And yet, that doesn't mean I didn't like listening to those tracks? I, I don't know. There are some records out there that have weak tracks on their own, but when placed on an album, makes sense in terms of the overall flow, and the White Album might be the prime example of that phenomenon. Wild Honey Pie, for example, is a bad, stupid, bad song that no sane human being should ever listen to on its own, but you slide that bad boy between Obla Di Obla Da and the continuing story of Bungalow Bill, and it's like, oh, this is a quirky little pause between two songs. What I'm saying is, the White Album is a mess. It's bloated, it's uneven, and it has some of the worst Beatles songs ever put to tape. But it's also chock full of ideas. It has more ideas in its 93 minute runtime than some bands have in their whole careers, and its good moments are among some of the best in their, or any, discography. If I may quote Paul, It was great, it's sold, it's the bloody Beatles White Album, shut up. Given the slow-burning emotional trash fire that was the White Album Sessions, the band took about two and a half months to recover. Thankfully, the public didn't have to wait that long for another Beatles album. I didn't say it was a new Beatles album. Despite the movie premiering in summer of 1968, Yellow Submarine the album didn't come out until January 1969. Alright, let's check out this track list. Yellow Submarine! That's from Revolver. All you need is love. That was an already released single. These four original tracks are fine, especially Hey Bulldog. I always get a kick out of John pretending to be a dog in the last minute. So what's after All You Need Is Love? Orchestral tracks from the movie and only one of them involved anyone from the Beatles. All of these were primarily arranged by George Martin, and they're fine. They work well in the context of the movie, but I don't feel like it's a soundtrack that stands on its own. Speaking of the movie, we have a reverse magical mystery tour situation here, because while I don't care for the album, I really enjoyed the movie. Again, it's primarily just a vehicle for Beatles music videos with the lightest of plots spread within. What's different this time though, is the animation. Yellow Submarine is the only animated Beatles movie, and it has such a unique visual identity because of it. This glove will haunt my dreams until I die. Apparently it was considered a landmark achievement in animation at the time, and I would say it holds up today. The only bummer is that the actual Beatles only show up for a one minute clip at the very end. But honestly, this is the one time where I would recommend checking out the movie instead of the album, because I have no problem calling Yellow Submarine the least good Beatles album, mainly because it's not really a Beatles album. It's an okay, EP sandwiched between pre-existing songs and the movie soundtrack. Paul envisioned their next album as a back-to-basics return, one that would emphasize live performance. The album, then titled Get Back, would be released alongside a live TV concert. However, the sessions for this record were a mixed bag, to put it kindly. All of the Beatles were tired of being the Beatles. They were tired of the public scrutiny. They were tired of working together. They were tired of the strain Apple Corps was putting on them. They were just 
tired. And the sessions reflected that, to the point where George Harrison briefly quit the band for a week. When he rejoined, the boys decided to shelve the TV documentary, wrap up recording, and put the project on the shelf but not without one last show. And so, as a complete surprise to the general public, the Beatles played live on the Apple Court building roof on January 30th, 1969. Fun fact, they did this concert as a birthday gift to me. They did it like 35 years before I was born, but still, they did it for me. This would end up being the last time all four of the Beatles ever played publicly together. Shortly after the performance, the Beatles sat down and decided they had one more album in them before calling it quits. They called up George Martin, they called up Jeff Emmerich, they went back to EMI in July 1969, and they hashed out a new record. This time, we got two pairs of advanced singles. First, in May 1969, there were two songs from the Get Back sessions, Get Back and Don't Let Me Down. I really enjoy both of these, but man, Get Back back still feel so unique in their catalog. More songs should just have Billy Preston on them. The other pair of singles this time was The Ballad of John and Yoko and Old Brown Shoe in summer 1969. They're fine. When it came time to name the record, Paul had an idea that was streets ahead, if you know what I mean. You see, EMI Studios was located on Abbey Road in London, so the boys went outside, took a pic of them walking on said road, and named their new record Abbey Road, which released in September 1969. This album feels like all the through lines of their career were reaching their peak. The guys had all matured into great musicians, their songwriting was top notch, their use of the studio was unrivaled, especially since now they were using an 8 track tape machine. And the songs on here display their growth to the fullest. Come Together and Oh Darling are blues songs written by John and Paul respectively, and they both demonstrate how far they had come since the covers of their early albums. Octopus's Garden is my personal favorite kid song by the Beatles. Ringo's vocals are good, and George's guitar work is excellent. Speaking of George, he delivers one of my favorite love songs ever with something. Fun personal story, when I was in college, one of my big midterms involved listening to the first 90 seconds of this song on repeat, mapping out every detail of the mix. I must have listened to it well over 500 times in a week, and I still love it. Now, some of that tonal whiplash from the White Album is still here. My favorite example is when you listen to I Want You, She's So Heavy with its lumbering outro, and the layers of noise piling up, then a hard cut, and then it's Here Comes the Sun, Happy Fun Guitar Time, yay! But while the first side has some of the band's most iconic hits, the second side is a different beast. After Here Comes the Sun and Because, we get an entire medley, from You Never Give Me Your Money to the end or technically Her Majesty. That first track is one of my favorite Beatles deep cuts. It is in and of itself a multi-part suite, with that heart-tugging melody by Paul leading into the more upbeat sections. The next three tracks are fine, though I don't usually listen to them on their own. But man, the stretch from She Came In Through the Bathroom Window to the end is the stuff of legends. I especially love how in Carry That Weight, they bring back the melody from You Never Give Me Your Money. The end was honestly my favorite Beatles song for a good while in high school. Somewhere there's an old iTunes account of mine with this as my most listened two song. It sounds like a curtain call after you just gave the best performance of your life. You know what? I'll say it. This is my personal favorite Beatles album. You might call that a lukewarm take. I call it a Kapchka test. All four of these guys were operating at their highest level, both as unique songwriters and as a whole, and it shows on almost every level. Abbey Road is the best possible ending the Beatles could have made. <laughs> So naturally, it wasn't actually their ending. The initial reaction to Abbey Road was fairly mixed at the time, with critics calling it a shell of past Beatles records. But of course, since then, it's been hailed as one of their best. And it even led to the folks at EMI deciding to embrace the inner street fan within them, as they renamed their building to Abbey Road Studios as a tribute to the Beatles ending. And make no mistake, the Beatles were ending. Right before the album released, John Lennon told the rest of the gang that he would be leaving the group. But there were still those get back recordings that were just gathering dust. Surely those could be made into something worthwhile, right? The boys' new manager, Alan Klein, thought as much, and so plans were made to turn the footage into a full-on movie accompanied by a soundtrack. To help with flushing out the soundtrack, producer Phil Spector was brought on, who was known for just killing it when it came to production, just absolutely murdering it. With instincts as sharp as a knife, Phil was basically given free reign to do whatever he wanted with these tracks. Most notable was his additions of a choir and orchestra to some of the tracks, which Paul was not a fan of. With some of the blokes already putting out solo material, the Beatles publicly announced their breakup in April 1970.
So of course their new album, Let It Be, came out a month after. Let It Be immediately separates itself from Abbey Road in its overall production. Many of the songs here feel less like uncharted sonic landscapes and more like dudes being dudes in the studio. Tracks like I Me Mine, I've Got a Feeling, and the aforementioned Get Back have this great bluesy feel to them and take advantage of the circumstances they were created in. Not every track feels like that though. The Long and Winding Road is one of those tracks that Phil just suffocated with his wall of sound approach. It's one of my favorite songs by Paul, but the production is a bit much. Like the orchestra I can get behind, but the choir makes the track feel pretentious. John's Across the Universe also got drowned in Phil's production, but I think it works for this song. It captures a sort of abstract awe that goes well with the added layers of production. John was actually pretty positive about what Phil did, saying, quote, he did a great job. When I heard it, I didn't puke. Why did that not make it onto the promo material? Overall, it's still a good album, but it can come off like an afterthought or a regression even, which would make sense because all these songs were done before Abbey Road. It just feels like a minor epilogue rather than a proper ending. Let It Be was the last album by the Beatles. By the time it released, the bandmates were already putting out or gearing up to put out solo material. And while the breakup was verbally confirmed, John and Paul's partnership did not officially dissolve until 1974. The official signature dissolving it was done by John Lennon when he was on vacation with family at Disney World. But we now enter an interesting place. Most of the dives I do, once the band ends, any solo careers that follow take up a minor footnote in the grand scheme of things. Now I'm not saying the Beatles' solo careers eclipsed the Beatles run, but all four of these guys went on to have major careers to the point where they could each fill up their own dive. I'll save those for another day, but until then, I wanna give a brief overview of what each of them got up to after the breakup. I'll also take this time to say, a lot of the discourse surrounding the Beatles these days is about them as people and whether or not they were good people. I will not be diving deep into that discourse, not because the conversation isn't worth having, but because it doesn't deserve to be shoehorned into what is already a very long discussion. Discussion. Thankfully, we'll be starting out with the least controversial of them all, the guy who wrote Mother. First off, let's just get this out of the way. Um, yep, here it is. Uh, feel free to get your jokes out of your system and... Um, yeah, let's, let's keep moving on. John's solo career started on a pretty off-kilter note. There was his first single, Instant Karma, which was followed by his first solo album, John Lennon, Plastic Ono Band. While opinions of it today are pretty positive, it definitely caught the public off guard. His next record was the more sonically conventional Imagine, featuring the hit single of the same name. In 1971, he and Yoko released the song, Happy Christmas War Is Over, which kicked off a four-year attempt by the US government to get him deported. The next year, he released Sometime in New York City, way more of a political album, but it got a pretty severe critical and commercial thrashing. In 1973, he released Mind Games, but also separated from Yoko. 1974, we got Walls and Bridges, which was also poorly received. 1975 saw not only a new covers album called Rock and Roll, but also his co-write on David Bowie's fame and his reuniting with Yoko. However, with his third child born in 1975, John's music career took a backseat for the next few years. His next major release would be Double Fantasy with Yoko Ono in November 1980. They recorded recorded enough songs for a follow-up called Milk and Honey to be released soon after. Unfortunately, John wouldn't get to see its release. In December of that year, he was shot outside his apartment by a deranged fan and shortly after died. Milk and Honey would eventually come out in 1984 as his last album. George had two solo albums out before the Beatles had broken up. His third album and first after the Beatles ended, released in 1970, All Things Must Pass. No surprise here, this is an excellent album, and while I'm not fully comfortable saying it's the best solo album by a Beatle, since I haven't heard every solo Beatles album, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely thinking it. The following year, he organized the Concert for Bangladesh, a two-night charity event meant to help refugees of the Bangladesh Liberation War. Along with supporting a good cause, the resulting live album went on to win Album of the Year at the 1973 Grammys. George continued releasing albums to varying degrees of acclaim until 1982, after which he focused on guest appearances for other artists' songs. In 1988, George helped form a supergroup band, the Traveling Wilburys. The remaining roster consisted of Jeff Lynne of Electric Light Orchestra, Tom Petty, Bob Dylan, and Roy Orbison, which considering how the Beatles toured with Roy early on is a nice full circle moment. These guys put out two albums together, though the group called it quits in 1991 after Roy's death. George would continue to release albums after the Wilburys until his death in 2001. His last album, Brainwashed, was posthumously released the following year. This is a serious message to everybody watching my 
Update right now. Ringo's had a real freaking weird career. He's got 20 solo albums to his name as of today. One of them is called I Wanna Be Santa Claus. If there's any Ringo songs you know, they're probably Photograph, You're 16, or It Don't Come Easy. He started a new band called Ringo Starr and the All-Star Band in 1990. It had better be him and clones of himself, otherwise I'll be mad. He's also the most active when it comes to collaborating with other Beatles. He's appeared on a bunch of albums by his former bandmates. Ringo's just been doing his own thing for the past 50 years, and honestly, He's earned it. Good for him. It's fair to say that Paul's had the longest and most illustrious solo career of any Beatle. At first, he recorded on his own along with his first wife, Linda. They made an album called Ram. Then they formed a new band called Wings. You probably know them for songs like Band on the Run, Silly Love Songs, the James Bond theme Live and Let Die. They were around until 1981. Paul kept releasing solo records after that, which he has continued to do up to last year with McCartney 3. I think he missed a few numbers there. He's collaborated with artists like Stevie Wonder, Kanye West, Rihanna, Michael Jackson. Speaking of Michael, while recording together in the 80s, Paul advised him to get into investing in music publishing. So naturally, Michael went ahead and bought the rights to the Beatles catalog. He would eventually give the rights to Sony about a year before his death. For investing advice aside, Paul's had a lucrative career. A thingy. A fiendish thingy! As one final part of this retrospective, I want to acknowledge some releases and pop culture artifacts relevant to the Beatles. Of course, naming every piece of pop culture influenced by the Beatles is like trying to count every time the word you has ever been used, so these are just some that have meaning to me. In 1973, we got the first two official Beatles compilations, the Red and the Blue album, God, now they're just ripping off Weezer. In 1977, there was the first official Beatles live album, recorded over three shows at the Hollywood Bowl over a decade earlier. Would you like to hear it? Nope, I did not accidentally start up my white noise machine. You're hearing the Beatles play live with all the screaming that God intended. This record would eventually be remixed and restored as part of the Eight Days a Week documentary in 2016. In 1988, Past Masters was released. The hook of this is that it includes every single Beatles song not included on the main albums, which means it features their first EP, Long Tall Sally, and the German language versions of their very first hits. 1995 saw the Beatles Anthology, an absolutely massive collection of unreleased recordings, a book, and a full TV documentary series. The whole series is considered to be the most complete Beatles documentary, so if you have the six hours to spare, it's worth checking out. I should also mention, along with the old stuff, we also got two new Beatles songs. Free as a Bird and Real Love were old John Lennon demos that the remaining three Beatles decided to revisit and produce into full songs, which makes them the last official Beatles songs. In 2000, there was one, the compilation of almost every Beatles number one hit, probably the best way to listen to all their big singles. The public certainly agreed, as it's the best-selling album of the 2000s in the US. In 2003, Paul spearheaded a new version of Let It Be called Let It Be Naked, which restores the album to its initial pre-Spectre vision. And it's fine, it doesn't transform the album in any major way, but for fans, it's an interesting look at what could have been. In 2006, we got a Beatles musical movie, Across the Universe. We can make fun of this movie all we want, the Bono cameo, the flimsy second half, but I will say, this movie was my first taste of a bunch of Beatles deep cuts, so it's always gonna hold a place in my heart. That same year, we also got Love, the soundtrack to the Cirque du Soleil show of the same name. I mainly bring it up because there's a mashup of Within You, Without You, with Tomorrow Never Knows. It's sick, and well worth a listen. In 2009, as part of a massive anniversary campaign, we got a proper Beatles video game, The Beatles Rock Band. I was a huge fan of Guitar Hero and Rock Band back in the day, and this game was another entry point into a lot of Beatles songs for me. Coming up very soon is Peter Jackson's Get Back documentary series, with a bunch of footage that didn't make it into the 1970 film. And lastly, let me take the opportunity to rant as if I haven't been doing that for the past hour. Since they came of age in the switch from mono to stereo, Beatles mixes are a major source of discussion amongst Beatles fans. And it's not just the original mixes, but all subsequent mixes as well. In 1987, we got new stereo mixes from George Martin on CD. In 2009, we got remastered stereo and mono mixes as part of a huge box set. And over the past five years or so, we've gotten new stereo mixes of the more acclaimed albums done by George Martin's son, Giles. I like both the 1987 mixes and the recent ones that Giles has done. But now I get to do something I've wanted to do for so long. I get to rant about how the 2009 stereo mixes suck. <laughs> now let me make my frustration clear. The actual process of getting the old master tapes digitized and prepared was very well done. The individual sound sources on each song are as crisp as can be, and the team behind this restoration should be proud. My issue lies entirely with the panning. Every single thing in the mix is panned hard left, 
hard right, or both to sum together. And it does not sound good. It sounds jarring by today's standards. Some might see this harsh stereo division as preservation. That's how stereo mixes were done back in their infancy. But if preservation's your goal, why not go straight for the mono mixes since most of these albums were mixed with mono in mind? To be fair, like I said earlier, the physical releases of the 2009 remasters included the mono mixes as well but they didn't put them on streaming, so at this point, does it even matter? Most people, and especially young people, listen to music on streaming services, and their primary way of listening to the Beatles requires them to listen to mixes that sound so foreign to what they're accustomed to. The listening experience is ruined the second you take out an earbud. In fact, this might be a hot take, but the animosity some younger people feel about the Beatles and how they're overrated and all that, these mixes on streaming are a primary reason why. If you're able to, check out the mono mixes, check out the recent remixes by Giles, check out the 1987 CD mixes if you can. The 2009 stereo mixes are the worst way to listen to many of these albums. Everywhere. The Beatles are pretty good. I see a lot of discourse these days about if the Beatles were overrated and all that. Of course, musical taste is subjective, and if you don't personally get the appeal tolls of the Beatles, that's okay. But I'll add one point to that discourse, and I'll need to compare the Beatles to some random little art house flick. You probably haven't even heard of it. Um, Citizen Kane? Citizen Kane is considered the de facto greatest movie of all time, but if you were born in the past 20 years or so, I'd be willing to bet that you would be disappointed by it. Not because it's aged poorly, but because on the surface, it doesn't do anything that hasn't been done by movies that came after. But consider this, those movies wouldn't have done those things if Citizen Kane hadn't done them first. The way that Citizen Kane took advantage of camera techniques and nonlinear structure just wasn't done at that time. And it laid out a radical groundwork for future movies to follow, but it also means that 80 years after its release, what it did might not seem that special to you. What I'm trying to say is it's your own personal call if you don't vibe with the Beatles, but through a combination of insane talent and once in a millennium luck, they were responsible for creating, or at least popularizing, a lot of conventions in popular music that we take for granted today. And for that, I'd say they deserve their place in the great music pantheon. If you want to get into the Beatles, I mean, everybody recommends Revolver, Sgt. Pepper, The White Album, and Abbey Road, and no surprise here, I recommend them too. Along with those, I would also recommend Please Please Me, Rubber Soul, and Magical Mystery Tour. And if you have a favorite Beatles song, album, related thing, I would love to know what it is in the comments.